I have a quiz for you all. Tell me, what emotion am I feeling in this photo? Happy, Happy sure, sure. What about this one? <laughs> Sad. All right, this one? So, yeah. It's, uh, okay, 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 that one's kind of hard to tell. I guess uh, inebriated isn't an emotion. But anyways, look. <laughs> two out of three, you passed, congrats. I have to say, though, I'm kind of surprised you all did so well. Because to understand and recognize emotions, that's a key part of empathy. Most of the people here today are college students. And college students are 40% less empathetic than students were 30 years ago. That statistic, it comes from the University of Michigan, where they've been doing a study. They've given thousands of students a one-page questionnaire asking them, basically, just one question in a lot of different ways. Do you think you're empathetic? So apparently, we're half as empathetic as the generation before us, and we seem to know it. And I don't know if we care. A lot of researchers are positing that the reason for this empathy deficit is because empathy is a skill you have to learn. And you learn it by interacting with people face to face. But when 8 to 18 year olds in this country are spending, on average, 11 and a half hours a day using technology and three hours a day using social media, we actually have fewer and fewer opportunities to hone that skill, to learn empathy. So the irony here is that these devices which are ostensibly about connection, creating social networks, might be the source of this growing disconnection. It also helps to explain why we know that we're less empathetic and don't seem to care, because we love our devices. We're the generation that spent more time holding a phone in our hand than another person's hand in our hand. The vast majority of us are addicted to technology. When are you ever without your phone? We check our phones on average about 110 times a day. It's so easy and so mindless. I find myself all the time unlocking my phone without thinking about it. It's all muscle memory. Typing, scrolling, swiping. <laughs> We're half as empathetic as the generation before us, but our thumbs are twice as strong. <laughs> we know definitively it's through vulnerable experiences that we learn empathy. But here, on these formats, we're not really being vulnerable. We're not showing all sides of ourselves. You don't see photos of me on Facebook sitting at home alone at 3 in the morning, eating goldfish crackers, watching Comedy Central. That's a big part of who I am in my life. <clears throat> you just see photos of me having cool adventures, living it up. You see one side of me, not all of me. I would say that my biggest insecurity is a fear of being unwanted, that people around me are just perpetually thinking, what is this weird, annoying, red-headed kid doing here? So with that in mind, let's take a look at my Facebook profile, because on it is a photo of me with a friend in a group costume and a photo that's me in the center of a group hug. Without even realizing it, I photoshopped my life so that the message that comes across to anyone who sees it isn't what I'd really like to say, isn't the truth, which is, hey, Sometimes I'm lonely and insecure and could use more love in my life. Rather, what's being said to anyone who sees this is, don't you for a second doubt that I have all the love and friends that I need. What's the last photo you posted to Facebook or Snapchatted or sent to Instagram? What were you hoping people would think about you based on that photo? What side of yourself were you trying to show? Empathy, M meaning in or into, pathy from pathos meaning feelings. Empathy, to go out of ourselves and into someone's shoes, into someone's feelings. Not only are we all getting worse at going out of ourselves, we're also getting worse at letting others in, myself being a prime example. Because when you aren't showing all of yourself, when you're not being vulnerable, we can't really empathize with one another. So what happens? What happens when you can avoid vulnerability, avoid accountability, avoid awkwardness? Here's one example. Uh, when I was 12 years old, I had this conversation with a friend over AIM chat. Hey Ari, hey Josh, what's up? 
I got a message from Mike. Oh, what did it say? Die, you fucking faggot. Whoa, he said that to you? No, no, he told me to tell you. What, are you serious? Yes, he told me to relay it. I'm getting a little inclined to agree with him. You're acting a little retarded and uh, gay. Why would you say that to me? I thought you were my friend. Okay, got to go, bye. G to G, bye. Avoid awkwardness, avoid accountability, avoid vulnerability, done. When we're young, we don't always use good judgment. We all know this firsthand. But we don't use good judgment because we've yet to form good judgment. Right here is your prefrontal cortex. It's where we house problem solving, decision making, and impulse control. And it's not fully developed until you're in your 20s. So imagine being 12 years old, lacking those skills, yet perpetually using these devices that ask you to respond immediately, make decisions immediately, click, like, tweet, post, tag. You're not asked to stop and think critically to work and grow this. What might happen? That conversation, which happens all the time. A lot of you have faced Josh's in your life, no doubt. As I was preparing to do this talk, a friend asked me, could I empathize with Josh? Thought about it for a minute and said, no, I don't think I've ever consciously hurt someone, tried to hurt someone in that way. My friend said, okay, but do you know what it's like to avoid awkwardness, avoid accountability, avoid vulnerability? And immediately, I thought of a story. A story that refused to go away, a story that takes place at almost the exact same time as that conversation, 2005, 12 years old. The difference is, it takes place offline. In this classroom, I was in seventh grade, new at this school, and my friend's dad came to pick him up early, friend Dylan. His dad comes to the door of the classroom and is like, Dylan at his desk. Dylan's dad. <laughs> so I'm watching this play out. And I think, this is adorable. Here's a father and son that are so close that they can communicate non-verbally to each other, even if they're upset. I start smiling, I start laughing, and a kid next to me turns to me and just goes, oh, Ari, I can't believe you'd laugh at someone who's deaf. I was so mortified. <laughs> I had no idea his dad was deaf, had no idea that they were signing to each other. I was so angry at myself for making a mistake like that. I was new, I wanted to be liked. Alongside that anger was a sense of shame because in my mind I thought I did something that looked bad and equated that to I am a bad person. Obviously in hindsight now it's such a forgivable innocent mistake. But then I felt that vulnerability and I felt so exposed. I didn't want to confront it. I don't know. I didn't know then if uh, Dylan had seen me laughing, if he thought anything. But I was too embarrassed, too angry, too ashamed to say anything. Anger and shame are neighbors. They like to walk down the street holding hands together. But they're distinct. Anger, why don't you want me in your group? Shame, why would you want me in your group? I had judged Josh for not facing me, yet I never faced Dylan. I thought in my head, I can't forgive myself, why would he? So a few weeks ago, I called up Dylan. Hadn't talked to him since middle school. And I said, hey, do you remember this happening? Do you feel anything, do you feel anything then? He says, no, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> there's no reason to feel so upset about it. You." Uh, don't need to beat yourself up about it. Don't be so hard on yourself. And I realized that over those 10 years, I, I was so worried about Dylan judging me, those other kids judging me. The only person who judged me was me. And I didn't realize that until I finally went out of myself and let someone else in. But I get what it is like to run away from vulnerability. In fact, I'm here talking about facing this empathy deficit. I couldn't even face someone in real life. After I talked to Dylan, 
I saw this quote. If you were to look into your enemy's heart, what would you find that's different from your own? I saw it. I took a deep breath, and I just thought, let's find out. So two weeks ago, I contacted Josh. Josh, the kid that sent me the message saying, die, you fucking faggot. And I found him online, messaged him saying I was doing this talk, attached an early draft of it, and I get an email back from him saying that that message, that conversation, was the most shameful thing he'd ever done. A shame he felt his entire life since and was especially on his mind last year when he came out as gay. I was surprised by that revelation, <laughs> certainly, but it wasn't the most surprising thing about his message. I was more shocked by the fact that he felt shame. Why, you may be wondering, well, remember that photo? I said, uh, what am I feeling in it? Everybody said sad. What if I told you just hypothetically, I was feeling shame in that photo? How could you tell? A little while ago, I was talking to one of the world experts on empathy in animals, and I asked him, do animals feel shame? He told me, maybe it's, it's unclear, but if they do, they certainly can't recognize it in one another. Because shame, it has to be self-reported in order to be distinguished from guilt, anger, sadness, what will you? So when I was 12, I told my parents about that conversation, and there was a mediation between me and Josh. I don't remember him saying anything. I do remember him standing there, arms crossed, head down. What I thought was anger, angry to be there. Now, in hindsight, shame, too ashamed to look at me. Much like you with this photo, I could not distinguish that he felt shame until he self-reported it. There was a part of, uh, of what Josh said that stuck with me. I couldn't quite figure it out. He said, on one hand, he was happy to be facing his actions now, glad that we had reconnected. On the other hand, he didn't want to be punished for his actions anymore. And I sat with that, and I, I was frustrated because I thought, I can't believe he thinks I'm trying to punish him. I don't want revenge. I don't want retribution. I want to move on to be adults. And as I looked over the, the message he sent me and how he said the words regret and shame in it, something just clicked. I just realized he's not talking about me punishing him. Only person who's been punishing Josh is Josh. And there I was in a position that never in a million years did I imagine I'd be, where I was empathizing with Josh. Avoiding vulnerability, trying to forgive yourself, I get that. And that shared experience, that empathy, meant that we could finally knock down the wall that still seemed to divide us. Sometimes, it seems like with emotions, you have to be a genius. You have to know what to do all the time. Truth is, I don't understand what drove him to write those words in press send. I don't know if he does either. But when it comes to empathy, you have to play the hand you've been dealt. You can't bluff your way through it. To say, I don't know, are very scary words, but sometimes all you can say, all I could say was, I don't know what to do, <laughs> but I'm willing to sit with you through the potential awkwardness, be open to vulnerability, and help you feel a little less alone. You don't need to have all the answers. You don't need to be this. You just need to be this. If you were to look into your enemy's heart, what would you find that's different from your own? First, let me say that enemy and bully are words that solely exist in black and white. Solely exist inside those quotation marks. Let this be a lesson that there's always gray. There was a study that followed people for over 40 years and found that the best indicator for lifelong happiness, in a lot of ways you'd think to measure it, longer marriages, uh, better health, lower rates of depression, job security, there was one factor more predictive than anything else. It was this, your emotional well-being as a child. Emotional well-being measured not as a, did you avoid trauma, did you avoid negative experiences, but when they happened, because inevitably they do to all of us, was there someone there that said to you, I might not know what to do, but I'm willing to sit with you through the potential awkwardness, be open to vulnerability, and help you feel a little less alone. 
To be empathetic is maybe the most important skill we will learn in our lives. What would you find that's different from your own heart? I, at least, have found nothing different. I saw Josh last week for the first time since we were kids. We just hung out. He was really cool. <laughs> we connected through the same technology that helped to tear us apart. We connected, and then we connected. This is not an anti-technology talk. It's a mindful technology talk. When we use our devices mindlessly, we burn bridges and don't see our friends for 10 years. And when we use it mindfully, we mend those bridges and come back together. And I'm happy to say that my friend Josh is here today in the audience. Do we care that we're 40% less empathetic than the generation before us? Because if we do, we have to start facing the empathy deficit by facing each other. If you're gonna use your devices, use them mindfully. Otherwise, give your thumbs a rest. Thanks. <laughs>